Would you please get out your Bibles? And maybe something to write with. And I want us first to go to Philippians 2. We're going to be in Matthew 7 and Philippians 2, so you can put a finger in each of those. But I want to read to you first from Philippians 2, the famous hymn that Paul writes for the Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This is verse 3 of chapter 2 of Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relations with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, and this is the part I want you to pay attention to, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And now if you would flip over to Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judged others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that is in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there was a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. As Jessica mentioned, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. And actually, last week, we were in this passage, too, with President Corey. But I want us to linger for another week on it as well, and for two reasons, and two things that I'm sorry for. One thing I'm sorry for is that for many of you, this was the first election season to which you really attended. You might have been aware of the previous one and had some engagement with that, but many of you now were old enough for the first time to vote. And this was your first experience of an election. And I think if you would talk to people older than you, they say they haven't all been like this. While elections do get feisty, this one was different. And I just want to say I'm sorry no matter where you are on the spectrum, you've had to suffer from a lot of harsh language and judgments. And so I think it's another, uh, I think it's a good week to linger again on this question of what it is to judge in the way that Jesus talks about it. And secondly, I just want to say to you that I know even in our regular lives, we have all been wounded by the judgments of others. I know some of you have been wounded time and again because maybe you've been judged for where you're from or by the color of your skin or how you talk or what you wear or what church you go to or what you like to eat or what you think or the shape of your body or what you're good at and what you're not good at. Seems like we can almost find anything to pass judgment on other people. So I'm sorry that you've experienced that. It's not a good feeling. Judgment of the kind that Jesus is talking about just makes us feel less than, doesn't it? Like someone's kind of pushed us down and they won't let us get back up. Or that we've been put in a box. Well, Jesus says to us this morning that he doesn't like that. And he doesn't want us to do it in that way. But of course, this should raise the question on your part, just like the man who raised his hand when Jesus talked about his neighbor and said, who is my neighbor? Uh, as you read this passage, you may raise your hand and go, but what is judgment? What is this judgment that you're talking about? And when is it okay? And when is it not okay? When is it helpful? And when is it not helpful? Well, I want you to look down at the passage in Matthew 7 
And I want you to notice, first of all, the number of times Jesus uses the word judge in just the first two sentences. In my translation, the word judge appears four times. In the Greek, judgment or a root of judgment appears five times. The word that appears five times in the Greek or its root is krino. So if you're writing this down, just write next in the margins if you write in your Bible. Krino, next to the word judge, K-R-I-N-O. The word is krino. It's the word we get the word critic from. You can hear the similarity, right? Krino, critic. Or the word from which we get critique. Or the word from which we get criticism. Our word judgment is a little stubbornly muddy, isn't it, in its sound? But krino has a kind of clash even in the sound of the word. I like words that sound like what they are, like crash or crackle. Well, crino's kind of like that. It kind of sounds like what it is, kind of a harsh grating, crino. And I normally don't quote, quote the Greek, but I want you to hear it in the Greek and hear kind of the crashing, critical sound of, the, of just the first eight words in the Greek. Hear it again. It crashes upon the ear, doesn't it? Do not judge lest you be judged, for the, by the judgment that you judge, you shall be judged. So what is this crinoing that Jesus doesn't like? How do we understand what this action is? Well, it can be defined several ways, and again, if you're writing notes, you can write some of these in the margin. To, to judge in many places in the ancient Greek world was simply to distinguish, to divide, to interpret, to explain. It wasn't necessarily negative. It actually originally came from farming. It was the word to sift, to separate the wheat berries from the chaff. It's our human capacity to make distinctions, to analyze, to discern. It's related to justice. Crino is related to the ability to make just decisions. In education, we might call it critical thinking. In research, we might call it analysis or data crunching. In wisdom, we call it discernment. Crino is much of what we learn to do in college to judge in these ways, and it's a good thing. And in fact, while Jesus tells us not to crino here, in other places in Scripture, it tells us to crino. So for instance, in Luke 7, when Jesus tells the parable of the money lender, and he has two debtors, and one debtor owes 500 denarii, and the other 50, 550, neither of them can pay, and he cancels both their debts, and he turns to those people who are listening and says, Who, which one do you think will love Jesus more? And when they say, well, probably the one who owed him more would love him more. Jesus says, you have judged, you have crinoed rightly. You have discerned how the heart works, how love and gratitude is born in the heart through forgiveness. You've crinoed rightly. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Paul is trying to reason with those in Corinth not to follow other gods or other values in their culture. And he's moving through the choices their ancestors made about idolatry, which ruined their lives. And so he says, I speak to you as sensible people. Judge Crino for yourselves, rightly. Crino for yourselves. Think clearly about two roads and where they will lead. And so here Paul's saying, you need to use your reason, your judgment about where your life will go as a result of decisions. So this is a good capacity. The crino capacity is a capacity for wisdom, discernment, thought, analysis, and we do it all day long. We have to. So how do we know when crino is good and when it's bad? How do we judge rightly and know when we should not judge. Well, as usual, our context helps us in this passage, because Jesus is talking within the earshot of Pharisees, 
who were part teachers, part politicians, part moral bookkeepers, and they taught the commands of the people. They taught people how to live. They taught people how to discern, how to crino in their lives so they would follow the biblical commands. And they had to deal constantly with distinctions where crino was needed between pure and impure, righteous and unrighteous, and various stratifications, especially strong in their society. They had to make a lot of judgments and distinctions, the Pharisees did. But interesting, Jesus says, and in fact, pretty much this whole first part of the Sermon on the Mount is thematized by Matthew 5.20, which says you must have a righteousness greater than the Pharisees. You must, in other words, have a crino, even though he's not using the word there, you must have a crino better than the Pharisees' crino, which would have seemed impossible, because the Pharisees were experts at discerning and understanding But Jesus says in another passage, Matthew 23, you know what, the way they do it, here's its effect on people. Matthew 23, 4. They, the Pharisees, tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. And they themselves are not willing to move a finger to help them. It says the effect of their crinoing is often to lay something on top of people's shoulders and it just weighs them down. It crushes them. The crino crushes them. And then verse 5 of 23, they, on the other hand, do all their deeds to be seen by others. Can you see what's happening here? The effect of their crino is to crush others and to raise themselves up. That's why Jesus objects to it. You know, sometimes we have a professor, Tim Milhoff, who talk about two kinds of communication. He'll talk about conceptual communication, which is actually the meaning of what we say. And Jesus doesn't always have a problem with the meaning of what the Pharisees say, right? Jesus says, I've come to uphold the law and not change a thing. But what he objects to is what Tim Milhoff would call the relational content. The conceptual content of our judgments can be actually maybe right or truthful, but the relational content can sometimes be to say, you are less than and I am greater. And that is how the Pharisees crenoed others. Well, that's how it is, isn't it? Every good capacity, every good power, every good ability, such as to discern, to be wise, to analyze, comes with a corresponding temptation. It comes with a temptation. Our power comes with a temptation. Jesus himself, for instance, wanted people to know he was different. (laughs) I am not the same as you. I am God, you are not. I am God, you are not. Jesus was, in a sense, trying to show them that he was different. And yet, as I read in the Philippians 2 passage, here's how he crenoed. Being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God. In other words, he did not consider his difference to be used for his own advantage. He did not want to crino in a way that crushed, but in a way that served. And you know what? I think that's a pretty good definition of the negative force of judgment here, and I'm going to give it to you if you have a pen. We will know when we are judging others when we point out differences and distinctions or make insights chiefly for our own advantage. We will know when we are judging others wrongly when we seek to point out differences or make distinctions or use knowledge chiefly for our own advantage. Advantage. And you know what? It feels good, (laughs) right? We'd have to be honest. It feels good to make those kinds of judgments that separate us from others. Because you and I are just deeply insecure creatures. We are small. And we are constantly looking for ways to secure ourselves in the world. And therefore, we seek points of difference between us and others in which we can elevate ourselves. The ego loves to take sides. The ego loves to take sides. 
and probably this started before each of us can remember, if you have brothers and sisters, <laughs> you know, as brothers and sisters, we were always trying to gain the upper hand on each other to point out how we were better or our siblings were worse than ourselves. And so it goes on. And it doesn't help that we live in a culture of judgment, right? I mean, sometimes Christians get um, uh, scorned a bit because we're, they, people think we're judgmental, but you know, we live in a whole culture of judgment. Uh, just look at reality TV, which has taken it to a whole new level, right? Survivor, America's Top Model, Hell's Kitchen, American Idol, The Voice, Bachelor and Bachelorette, so sorry, I know I'm stepping on toes. <laughs> Celebrity Apprentice, and it goes on and on. Now, not all of these shows are, you know, equal in their severity, you know, I'm not, uh, I haven't seen them all, I've seen some. Um, but through them, we are constantly invited to sit in the chair of the judge, aren't we? We are constantly invited to sit in the chair of the critic, and sometimes we get to vote for the fate of others, and it feels, it feels good. And we've been doing it all our lives. It's kind of like riding a bike. It's just so easy. It's so automatic. We don't even have to think about it. I want to say to you that as we think about our growth and our spiritual formation, most of us already know what the right thing to do is in many cases. But we have to train ourselves to do it. Because for a long time we've been doing things the other way. For a long time, you and I are very practiced in judging things to make us feel better, in judging people to make us feel better. And we feel it in our bones. We feel it in our nerves. We're used to that feeling of feeling better and more secure when we can judge someone for our own advantage. Jesus says that was not the intent of this capacity this capacity to make discernments and, and judgments and to think. He says, in fact, the role of crinoing is healing others, restoring their vision, restoring our vision. And this is where Jesus makes a carpenter joke. This is the closest Jesus gets to being funny. <laughs> he says, it's like if you were trying to take a speck out of someone's eye. I mean, you know how delicate that is? I mean, most people will not let you do it. They'll say, I got something in my eye, and then you'll go, well, let me help. They go, no, 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 don't touch me. I'm thinking of Rachel's eye phobia on Friends, if you've seen that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> it's such a delicate thing to heal someone of a speck in their eye. He's saying it's like, if you're judging people, it's like you're trying to take something out of their eye, but you have a beam over your own. I think Jesus expected people to laugh at that moment. He says, that's ridiculous. You cannot help people or love people or help them discern if you don't care for their healing, their restoration, and for your own. In fact, it's better if you just said nothing at all. Do no harm is what doctors first learn when they're becoming doctors. And as we are becoming people who are developing the qualities of discernment in our classes and critical thinking analysis, the first rule should be, however, do no harm. Train yourself to love others, to practice again and again seeking not the pleasure of our superiority, but the pleasure of helping one another to see, helping ourselves to see, of taking the log out of your own eye. This, if you wanted a definition of spiritual formation, there it is from Jesus. Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly how to love others. But I'm here to tell you this will take training, because we've been riding the same bike for a long time, and we've had the same feelings in our body of what it feels like to crino in the way Jesus doesn't like. So how do we retrain our bodies? How do we retrain our bodies to do it differently? Well, I'm gonna give you six ways, if you've got a pen. And here's how it's gonna happen, by the way, and it's probably gonna happen today. You're gonna to be with a small group of people, 
two or three maybe. Maybe after chapel, maybe after class, maybe up at the eagle's nest. And someone is going to say something about someone else and how they're different. Or it may be on Facebook or Instagram or on someone's blog or in one of the anonymous chat apps. Someone is going to say something about someone what did, what someone said, some way they were, some mistake they made, something they believe, and it's going to come to you like a slow pitch. And you go, man, I can smack this sucker out of here. That's how it's going to come to you. Here are some things you can do instead. It's always an option not to say anything. <laughs> It'll be awkward, because the person will be baiting you into a crino, into an unhealthy crino. They'll be baiting you, and you could always say nothing. But awkwardness, my friends, is not a sin. <laughs> you can always just say nothing. Right? Matthew 12, 26, and wow, this really hurts me, says, we will be judged for every careless word we make. Wow, that, my friends, is a painful prospect for me. <laughs> every careless word. So the first thing you can do is just not say anything. The next thing you could do is when that person is pointed out among people or on Facebook or however they're gestured toward, is to actually, instead of crinoing them, in a bad way, thank God for them. There's always something good about someone. Thank God for them, and even thank them for the difference that may be pointed out. Thank God for people's differences and distinctions. The third way I want to call triangulating your vision. When you look at someone and you're tempted to crino them, to kind of raise yourself up over them, to triangulate the vision means to look up and look down. You look up at God and you look down at that person and you realize, oh my gosh, that is God's child. It would be like saying something about a child in front of their parent, something negative. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't say, hey, you're Johnny. He stinks at whatever. You wouldn't do it. Triangulate your vision. When you are tempted to push someone down, look up at God and go, oh my gosh, that is God's beloved child. Fourth way, rather than take the opportunity to meditate on their failings, allow it uh, as an opportunity to, to think of your own. Because remember, your first job is to take the log out of your own eye. Fifth, when you're tempted to crino someone in a way that is to your own advantage, pray for them. Pray for them instead. And six, if they're in a room, I would hope you might reach out to them instead of crinoing them from afar. You know, as I said before, judgment is related to justice in the positive sense in scripture. To create a community of shalom to enjoy the abundant life of peace. And I think, and I bet you would agree instantly, that if we could learn the capacity to understand, to analyze, to discern, to grow wise, and if we could train ourselves not to use those powers to push people down and raise our, ourselves up, we would all experience so much more peace in community and in ourselves. One of the Desert Fathers, Abbot Poemin, says this, never despise anybody, never condemn anybody, never speak evil of anyone, and the Lord will give you peace. Never despise anybody, never condemn anybody, never speak evil on anyone, and the Lord will give you peace. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.